Good morning. Our topic for today is advanced mathematics. Okay, first we'll discuss matrix. Matrix is a rectangular array of numbers denoted by square or round brackets. It consists of M rows and M columns. This is an example of a matrix. Here we have a 2 by 2 matrix. Determinant is a scalar one calculated from a square matrix. So if we have a square matrix, we can calculate its determinant. We have order of determinant. We have a second order, order 3, and order n determinant. Here we have a 2 by 2 matrix. The determinant of this matrix is an order 2. And this is a 3 by 3 matrix. It has a third order determinant. The minor. The minor can be calculated from a square matrix. Suppose we have element A or we have this matrix and we want to determine the minor of element 1. The minor of element 1 may be determined by identifying the row containing that element, identify also the column containing that element, and then we remove that row and column. The remaining matrix has these values or elements, 9, 9, 5, 2. The determinant of this new matrix is called the minor of that element. So the minor of that element on row 1, column 1, is the determinant of this final matrix. Suppose we want to determine the minor of this element 5, located on row 3, column 2. First, we identify the row and column containing that element. And then we remove that element, giving us this final element. 1, 3, 5, 9. Now, the determinant of this final matrix is called the minor of the element on row 3, column 2 of the original matrix. The cofactor is assigned minor. Suppose we have this matrix and we want to determine the cofactor of A1, 1. one. If this is matrix A, then A11 one, one means the element located on row 1, column 1. Identify the row and column containing that element. What we have here is 9952. This is the minor of the original or the minor of element 1. one. Now, we calculate the sign or we determine the sign of this minor using this formula. A constant negative 1 is raised to the sum of the location of the element. The location of the element is on row 1, column 1. Thus, we have negative 1, square, or positive 1. So, meaning the cofactor of the element A11 is, this is, positive one and then we determine the determinant of this new matrix so we have negative 27 as its cofactor now we can also determine the cofactors of other elements as as the cofactor of 5 the procedure is just the same okay compute the determinant of here we have a 2 by 2 matrix it is easier to calculate the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix by hand. We only multiply in that direction that is equal to 2e to 5x. And then we also multiply in that direction that is equal to 3e to 5x. Now, we have 2e to 5x minus 3e to 5x and our result is negative e to 5x. This is the determinant of that matrix. Take note, we can only compute the determinant if a matrix is a square matrix. 
that is the number of row is equal to number of columns. Evaluate the determinant of A. Now here we have a 3 by 3 matrix. Computing the determinant of this matrix by hand will take us time, so I will use the calculator instead. In order to determine the determinant of this matrix, first We need to set the calculator into matrix mode. So here's our calculator. First, we need to set the mode of the calculator into matrix if it is not yet in matrix. Press mode button and then select number six for matrix. Now, when we select number six for matrix, the calculator suggests us to enter an initial matrix. So, we enter an initial matrix, which is in this case, matrix A. We select number 1 for matrix A. The dimension of this matrix is 3 by 3. The first number in that dimension is the row, and the next is column. And then we enter the value 1, 0, 4, and then 2, 2, 6. And 3, 1, negative 4. Now we press AC to clear the screen of the calculator. Now we are ready to perform the operation on that matrix by accessing the menu of the matrix. The menu of the matrix is located on number 4. To access that, we press Shift and then click number 4. Now we can see the function depth which is on number 7. We can also see there the dim. Dim means if we want to enter a new matrix. We can also access the data of other matrices such as in matrix A, B, and C if they are already entered. And we can also determine the transpose of the matrix which is on number 8. Now, since our goal is only to determine the determinant, so we select the determinant function. And then the argument of this function is matrix A. So again, we access matrix A by going back to the menu of matrix. We select number 3, and then we close the function. Press equal, we get the determinant of A. What is the cofactor of the first row, second column element of A? <coughs> okay, so we will determine or we will identify first that element that is located on the first row, second column, and that element is 1. What is the cofactor of 1? First, we identify the row and column containing 1 what retains is the matrix now determine the determinant of this matrix we have negative 2 0 0 and negative 1 we have here negative 2 0 0 and negative 1 now after determining the determinant of this matrix we assign it with the sign here the sign here is determined by the location of the element on the original matrix. We have negative 1 raised to. This is on the first row, meaning 1. This is on the second column, meaning 2. So the constant here is negative 1 raised to 1 plus 2. Now, negative 1 raised to 3 is equal to negative 1. So, we have letter C as our answer. The types of matrices. We have a row matrix such as this one. We only ha also have column matrix such as this one. We also have square matrix if the number of uh, column is equal to the number of row. We also have triangular matrix if it forms triangles on the other side of the diagonal, whether it's only up 
upper side or on the lower side. As you can see here, we have zeros forming triangle. We may also have here zeros forming triangles on the other side. Diagonal matrix whose elements above and below the principal diagonal are zeros, such as this one. Scalar matrix. This is a diagonal matrix. Whose elements along the principal diagonal are all equal. Now, as you can see, all of the numbers except those on the diagonal are zeros, meaning this is diagonal matrix. But these elements are all equal, meaning this is scalar matrix. For a unit matrix, a unit matrix is a scalar matrix. Whose elements on the diagonal are all zero. We also have null matrix. All elements are zero. For addition and subtraction of matrices, suppose we have two matrices A and B. Now, if we want to determine the sum of A and B, we simply add element to the corresponding element. We cannot add two matrices if their dimension is not identical. So here we have two by two matrix. This is also a two by two matrix. Then we can add these two matrices. So we simply add one plus three, that is four. Two plus four, that is six, and so on. So the sum of these two matrices is this new matrix. For the multiplication of matrices, it is a bit complicated because first we need to verify whether the mul multiplication is valid. Suppose we have two matrix A and B. We need to deter determine whether this operation is valid. This is our check. If the number of columns on A is equal to the number of rows on B, then the operation is valid. The resulting matrix has, or the resulting product matrix, has this dimension. The dimension is the number of row on A by the number of column on B. Assuming these are our matrices. In order to multiply these two matrices, A times B, we need to determine whether the number of columns on the left is equal to the number of rows on the right. Now, this is one, two columns. This is one, two rows, meaning the operation of A times B is valid. And the dimension of the product matrix is equal to the number of rows. This is two rows, and this is one column. So the resulting product must have two by one dimension. And this is how we do it. First, we multiply this by this. This is row one. This is column one, meaning the location of the element on the product matrix is on row one, column one. So row one, this multiply one by one is one. Two by two is four. Now this one, we multiply this element, 3, 4 by 1, 2. This, in, this is on row 2. This is column 1, meaning the element resulting value must be on the row 2, column 1. This is row 2, and this is on column 1. Okay, for the division of matrices, it is not valid to divide in matrices because it is not defined. But we can determine... Uh, but we can proceed with the division by using multiplication instead. So, instead of dividing, we multiply it by the inverse of the divisor matrix. Division of matrices can be done only by multiplying the given matrix by the inverse of the denominator matrix. Okay, and this is the procedure. First, in order to determine the inverse of a matrix, this is the rule to determine the inverse of the matrix. First, find the determinant of A. Suppose the matrix is A. Next, we form the transpose matrix of A. 
and then we form the adjoint matrix of A, and then we divide each element of the adjoint matrix by the determinant of A. Okay, what is the transpose matrix of A? Here we have a matrix. The transpose is simply um, repositioning of the elements of the matrix. Thus, it does not require calculator function or method. Trans means change. Pose means position. This is the transpose of that matrix. The first row in the original matrix becomes the first column on the transposed matrix. The second row becomes the second column. The third row becomes the third column. Given the matrix equation, solve for x and y. So here we have two matrices, and we need to determine the value of x and y. First, we need to verify whether this operation is valid. There are one, two columns. There are one, two rows. The operation is valid. Now, let's determine the product matrix dimension. There are one, two rows. Since there are two rows in the left matrix, then the product matrix must also have two rows. On the right, we have one column, meaning the product matrix will have one column. And then we multiply this column by this or this row by this column. So we have 1 times x is x. 1 times y is y. This is row 1, this is column 1. Therefore, on the product matrix, the resulting value is on the row 1, column 1. Now, this is on row 2, column 1. In the product matrix, it must be liquidated on row 2, column 1. And that is 3 times x, 3x. 2 times y, 2y. And x plus y is equal to 2, so we have x plus y equals 2. In 3x plus 2y is equal to 0. Now you can use your algebra to determine for the value of x and y. But in my case, I will use the calculator. The equation uh, function of the calculator. Okay, select mode and then select equation. This is uh, two equations to unknown, so we select number one. And then we enter the coefficients of this uh, equation. Okay, when we press equal, we'll get the value of x first. And then pressing equal again, we get the value of y. What is A times B? Now this is uh, these are three by three matrices. Now let's verify whether the operation is valid here. The number of rows on matrix A is three. I'm sorry, the number of columns on matrix A is three. The number of rows, uh, the number of rows on B is also three. Then the operation is valid. But multiplying using this, uh, using uh, long method or by hand will take us time. So I will use the calculator instead. In order for us to perform multiplication of matrices. We need to set the mode of the calculator into the matrix mode if this is not yet in matrix mode. So we press the mode button and then we select matrix, which is on number 6. Now the calculator suggests to enter an initial matrix and we enter our initial matrix to be our matrix A. And the dimension is 3 by 3, so we select 1. And then we enter the element of matrix A.
OK. And then we press AC to clear the screen of the calculator. This time, do not press mode again. Because when we press mode again, it will reset the data in the matrix. We can add another matrix by simply going to the menu of the matrix. We are already on the matrix mode. So meaning we cannot press mode again. It will delete the matrix. So to access the menu of the matrix, it is located on number 4, matrix. We press shift and then we press number 4 to display the menu of the matrix. Here we have the button dim, which means if we want to enter another matrix. Now, since you want to enter another matrix, then we need to select number one to enter a new matrix. And then we enter it to matrix B2 because we already have matrix A. And then the dimension is 3 by 3. And then we enter the elements of matrix B. Okay, so then we clear the screen of the calculator and then we are now ready to multiply the two matrices. We will access these two matrices again through its menu, shift and then number four. Matrix A is number three times matrix B access again matrix B through its menu, shift number four and that's matrix A. B is on number 4. Press equal. Now, as you can see, the resulting matrix is also the matrix A. It is because our multiplier, B, is a unit matrix. So, if a matrix is multiplied by a unit matrix with the same dimension, the resulting matrix is the original matrix. Okay, so we are now on imaginary numbers. An imaginary number is defined as the square root of negative 1. And these are the powers of the imaginary number i. Our i raised to 1 is simply i. Our i is square because our i is also equal to square root of negative 1. Squaring square root of negative 1 will cancel or will eliminate the radical symbol. What we get is negative 1. So i squared is negative 1. i cubed is simply i times i squared because 1 plus 2 is 3. So meaning i times i squared is simply i times negative 1 is negative i. Now for i to the 4th, this is simply equal to i squared times i squared or negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Now for i to the 5th, this is equal to i, this is negative 1, negative i, 1. As you may observe that this pattern is just the same as here, it is because i to the 5th is equal to i to the 4th times i, and i to the 4th is 1. So we'll have i. i to the 6th is i to the 4th times i squared, and i to the 4th is 1. So i squared is negative 1. i to the 7th is equal to i to the 4th i cubed, so we'll have i cubed here, negative 1. And we'll have i to the 4th, which is 1. The general formula for the powers of the imaginary number. If the exponent of i is 1 more than the multiple of 4, then the result is i. If it is 2 more than the multiple of 4, then it is equal to negative 1. If it is 3 more than the multiple of 4, it is negative 1. And if it is a multiple of 4, it is equal to 1. Okay, so let us now proceed to complex number. If A and B are real numbers, 
and i is equal to the square root of 1 then a plus b is called a complex number a complex number is always represented in the argon diagram the argon diagram is like a cartesian coordinate system where the horizontal axis is the real number the vertical axis is the imaginary part suppose we have a number which is um, this one has a f has a real part of four an imaginary part of three this number may be written as four plus three i this is a rectangular form of that number this number may be represented also in another form where we can determine the distance of that point from the origin and so let's say the distance is r that distance is called the modulus of that complex number the modulus of the complex number may be determined using the Pythagorean formula because this is indeed a right triangle so in this case it is very easy to see that r is equal to 5 and we can also determine the angle using the arctan function arctan of 3 over 4 that is our angle so we'll have a polar form of that number where it is expressed in the angle it is expressed in the modulus and the angle the angle is called the argument so our r is 5 and our angle using the arctan of 3 over 4 is 36.9 in degrees now if what we have given is in polar form we can reverse the operation to determine the rectangular form that is we simply determine the horizontal component and the vertical component. The horizontal component is the real part, which is 5 cosine of that angle. R cosine of that angle is the horizontal part. The vertical part is 5 sine of that angle. This expression is called the trigonometric form of the complex number which is written simply as 5 CIS 36.9 C stands for cosine and I stands for the imaginary part and S stands for sine another form of complex number is called the exponential form it looks almost the same as the polar form so this is the exponential form for exponential form, we have the same r5. We have replaced the uh, angle symbol by e, and then our angle e is shifted to the exponent of e. Uh, bearing in mind that 36.9 here is in degrees. Most of the time, the exponent must be expressed in radian. Okay, so these are the operation on complex numbers. Suppose we have two complex numbers, c, small c, which is a plus b i, and we have another complex number, big c, which is a plus b i. These numbers, when represented in polar form, are these numbers. The small c is small r angle theta, and the big c is big r angle beta. Now, when we add these two, com two complex numbers, c plus c, it is much better to express this number in rectangular form and add the corresponding element. So, we simply add A to A and B to B. What we get is the final complex number. So, the most convenient way to add complex number is to express the two complex number in rectangular form. Now, to multiply two complex numbers, to complete to multiply two complex numbers like this, c times c, it is most convenient to write the complex number in in polar form. Because in polar form, we have a simpler uh, formula: the product of the the product of the modulus, and the angle is the sum of the argument. To divide two complex numbers, say we divide c by c, it is most convenient to write this in polar form we have divide the modulus 
uh, R by R and the angle is theta minus beta this is minus beta and then if you raise the complex number to some power n it is convenient to write that number again in polar form the final result will be r raised to n and the angle is 10 times theta also if you want to evaluate the root of the complex number it is convenient to write the complex number in polar form and evaluate its root using this formula first we have okay so let's say this is a small r so our r raised to 1 over n it is just the same as c to the power of n we simply raise our r to 1 over n so 1 over n and our angle 1 over n times theta because uh, here we have n and we have multiplied n by theta so our exponent is to be multiplied by theta since 1 over n times theta is theta over n, this is the first root of our complex number. In order to determine the other roots, we simply add 360 to theta and then evaluate the new angle. This is the second root of the complex number. To determine the third root of the complex number, we add another 360 and then evaluate the new angle. This is the third root of the complex number. So if we are determining the cube roots, meaning these are, this will be the sets of the roots of that complex number. Now, if we want to determine the natural logarithm of a complex number, it is convenient to write the complex number in radian, in radian, in, I know, in polar form, and then evaluate using this formula the natural logarithm of the modulus plus um, theta i where theta must be expressed in radian we may also evaluate the trigonometric function of the complex number such as if you want to determine the sign of some complex number c and this will be our formula it is convenient to write the the complex number in rectangular form when evaluating its trigonometric function. So, we write a number in trigonometric for in rectangular form. This is a, uh, assuming this is a and this is b. Then we'll have sine of uh, okay, sine of x plus y is equal to sine of x hyperbolic cosine of y plus cosine of x hyperbolic sine of y assuming that our x and y are a and b respectively okay so as you may observe that when we evaluate the complex numbers when we add a complex number and we perform the trigonometric function of the number it is convenient to write the number in rectangular form If we perform the multiplication, division, power, root, and the natural logarithm, we write the number in polar form and evaluate the complex number. And these are the sets of the trigo functions of complex numbers. For the sine, if we have sine of x plus yi, this will be the equivalent value of sine of the complex number. We have here hyperbolic cosine and we have also here hyperbolic sine. For the cosine, we have this value. For the sine, obviously, if we have only sine, meaning um, the real part is zero, because here, if the real part is zero, so sine of zero is zero, so this will be cancelled out. And cosine of zero is one, so what we have is sine. So that's why here we have hyperbolic sine of x i. For the cosine, we have this value. For the tangent, for the cotangent, for the second cosecant. And for the rest of the trigonometric functions we have here. These are the basic trigonometric functions of the complex numbers. Where the hyperbolic functions hyperbolic sine of h 
of x is simply equal to e to the x minus e to negative x over 2. And this is for the hyperbolic cosine. And for the hyperbolic tangent, it's simply the ratio of these two quantities. Okay, simplify i raised to 29 plus i raised to 22 plus i. Okay, so we write i to 29 as i raised to 28 by u plus 1 because 28 is multiple of 4. And then we write 22 as 20 plus 2 because 20 is multiple of 4 plus 1. Now, i to the 28 plus 1 is simply i, and this is i square is negative 2, and then we have i is equal to i. So, we have negative 1 plus 2i. Well, we can also compute this using the calculator because the calculator has a special mode for complex operations. In order to perform complex operations, we need first to set the mode of the calculator in complex. So press the mode button and then select complex, which is number 2 in my calculator. Now we can uh, we can now write this complex expression by pressing directly n which is our i raised to 29 and then plus we have i raised to 22 and then plus we have finally i so we have negative 1 plus 2 i simplify 3 minus i squared less 7 times 3 minus i plus 10 now this expression can be solved directly through the complex function of the calculator so first we set the calculator into complex mode and then we just enter the expression. So we have 3 minus i squared minus 7 times 3 minus i plus 10. So pressing equal, we have negative 3 plus i. What is the simplified expression of the complex number? Here, we will divide 6 plus 2.8i by 3 plus 4i. Although the, the imaginary component here is in j, uh, it is just another uh, representation of the complex number. So we have uh, mentioned earlier that when we divide complex number, it is much better to express them in polar form. Now we must express this into polar form if you wish to. But in my case, I will use the calculator because the calculator complex function can handle this efficiently. So in my calculator, I will set the mode to complex press number 2 and then enter the expression exactly as uh, shown on the problem so we have 6 plus 2.8 we'll use the i variable or by constant i constant here divided by 3 plus 4i okay press equal now the result is expressed in fraction form. We can press the SD, which means decimal to standard form. That is a toggle button that you can uh, press again to make it in standard form. If A is equal to 40 E raised to 120 degree I and B is 20 angle negative 40 degrees and C is equal to 20 plus 3 I solve for A plus B plus C.
because all of this made all of this complex number are defined we can simply use the calculator directly to solve for the sum of these complex numbers now as you may observe that my calculator is set in region mode i must first set it into degree mode so i select number three for degrees because the angles for my complex numbers are all in degree so we are now in degree i press mode to set that to complex mode this is the advantage of the calculator because we can or the complex function of the calculator can handle polar and rectangular at the same time so meaning we can write 40 angle 120 plus 20 angle negative 40 plus the rectangular form of the complex number 20 plus 3i Now, this is a mixture of polar and rectangular complex numbers. Pressing equal, this gives us uh, the result in polar form. I'm sorry, in rectangular form. If we want to determine the polar form of this complex number, we, print, we simply access the menu for the complex number. Shift number 2, and then there is that function R angle theta, meaning if we want to convert the result into polar form so press that and then we press equal we get the equivalent in polar form where 58.27 is in degrees because the calculator is set in degree evaluate j raised to j okay let's try this approach first we convert j to polar form well, you can draw J on the Argon diagram and you can determine easily the equivalent polar form of J. But in my case, I will use the calculator to determine the polar form of J. First, I set the calculator into the complex mode. And then I will type, since I do not have J, uh, first we need to verify, we need to um, set our R into radian mode. And then uh, we convert our I into the polar form. We uh, select complex and then we select R under theta. Now I or J in polar form is one angle and the theta in region is one half pi. So meaning J is equal to one angle pi over two or in exponential form this is our r is 1 we, shim, we simply shifted our angle to the exponent of e pi over 2 and then that i now it means that j raised to j is equal to that quantity raised to j now we can distribute j inside of the expression so j times j is equal to j squared now since we know that j squared is equal to negative 1 then we have the final expression as uh, j raised to j is equal to 1 e raised to negative pi over 2. Evaluate sine of 0.7i. So here is our formula to calculate the sine of a complex number. The real part is 0, the imaginary part is 0.7. So this is the result for the sine of 0.7i we have the hyperbolic sine of 0.7i where i is the outside of the hyperbolic sine function determine the cube roots of 8 120 degrees so in polar form we have 8 angle 120 raised to 1 third now 8 raised to 1 third and the angle is 120 divided by 3 this is the first root of our cube roots. Our cube roots has three values. This is the first root. The first root is called the principal root of our cube root. The second root, we simply add one, add 30 degrees to our angle and evaluate the new angle. This will be the new or the second root of our cube root. 
And finally, this is the third in the final cube root of our expression. We have 120 plus 360 plus another 360. Find the principal fifth root of 50 cosine 150 j sine 150. This expression may be written as if we distribute the 50 to the terms inside of the parentheses, we got this value. Note that this is equivalent to 50 angle 150. And we calculate the fifth root of this quantity. We raise one we raise 50 to one fifth and then we divide the angle 50 by 5. Then this is the first root of our complex number and this is the principal root evaluate natural logarithm of 3 plus 4 i now this number is expressed in or our complex number is expressed in rectangular form we need to express this number first into polar form so the 3 plus 4 i uh, in my case, I will use the calculator. You may use the trigo functions or you may use the Pythagorean formulas and the trigo functions to determine the equivalent polar form. But in my case, I will use the calculator functions. So first, I have to set the mode of the calculator into a matrix. But before that, we need to verify that the angle is in radian because the natural logarithm Arguments must be expressed in radian. So select complex and then I write 3 plus 4i. Now, let's convert that into polar form by accessing the menu of the complex number. Shift number 2. And then we select R angle theta press equal now this is in radian so we now have this number in radian form and this is now this is now the equivalent of that logarithm we have the logarithm of the modulus plus the argument i Okay, evaluate natural logarithm of negative 1. So, ln of negative 1 is equal to, well, you may first, in my, let's first convert negative 1 into its polar form. You can draw that in the argon diagram and verify easily or determine easily the equivalent of that number in the polar form. But in my case, I will use the calculator instead. So in the calculator, I write negative 1. Make sure that we are in the radian uh, degree and that our calculator is set in matrix in complex mode. So I write negative 1 and then convert that into the polar form. In the polar form, I select R angle theta. And this is equal to 1 angle pi. Or... The logarithm of negative 1 is ln of r plus theta i. Our r is 1, our theta is pi. And since the natural logarithm of 1 is equal to 0, then we have pi i as the, natu as the natural logarithm of negative 1.